In the last video, we introduced the definition of a Lie algebra, and that was kind of abstract. And so in this video, we're going to focus on one of the examples that I introduced last time, which were the n by n matrices. In particular, the n by n matrices and any of their subalgebras are referred to as the linear Lie algebras. And so the reason we will look at this is twofold. First of all, uh, historically, this is what kind of motivated the study of Lie algebras. And second of all, it's a concrete example that everyone's familiar with, that we can really understand what's going on. And what actually turns out uh, is that the, in the, for any finite dimensional Lie algebra, it can actually be identified with some linear Lie algebra. So really, if you're clever about it, uh, studying the, the linear Lie algebra is actually sufficient. And this is actually much harder to prove, so I won't justify that. However, in the semi-simple case, um, which is what we kind of devote a lot of our study to, and I'll introduce all these terms later on again, but it's really clear that um, any, any semi-simple Lie algebra can be identified with a, a linear Lie algebra. That, that's a much, much easier proof. And so, to begin, I'll actually introduce the formal terms here. And so, let V be a vector space over a field F, and V is the set of all linear transformations from V into V. Now that should be familiar, and recall that NV is also a vector space by its own, in its own right over F. And so we can make NV a Lie algebra by defining the bracket of any two endomorphisms X and Y to be X composed with Y minus Y composed with X, where, once again, this is composition of linear maps. And so when NV is endowed with this bracket, we call it the general linear algebra. And so any subalgebra of the general linear algebra is called a um, linear Lie algebra. And so it would be wise to make sure that we satisfy our axioms. And so bilinearity is pretty much immediately obvious from uh, this definition. If you just plug in AX plus Z and bracket with Y, you'll see it works out. And so I'll leave that to the viewer. And alternativity is pretty obvious as well. X bracket X is clearly X times X minus X times X, which is zero. And the Jacobi identity is a little less obvious, but if you just simply take this definition and then expand this thing out, you will see that it's equal to zero. And so I'm not personally a big fan of doing explicit computations in the video um, because I think it, it's a little bit, it can actually be a little bit boring, but I do, I think it's very important that the, the viewer carry them out. And so we, we satisfy these three axioms, and so it is indeed a Lie algebra. Um, and so we'll be using, uh, we'll be looking at G L of V a lot. Early on, however, it's nice to identify V with the basis and really look at G L of V in terms of matrices, right? We can think of linear transformations as matrices once we fix a basis for the uh, vector space we're working with. And so if V has finite dimension n, we can identify um, GL of V with something called GL of N comma F. And so these are just equivalent ways of describing the same thing. Um, and instead of uh, composition of linear maps, we use matrix multiplication, but it's the same brackets. And so um, GL of N comma F is a little bit easier to work with because we, we work with matrices, it's less abstract. And so that's what we'll kind of focus on for the rest of this video. And so to begin, we'll just uh, kind of just slowly develop GL n comma f. So we know it's a vector space because n v is a vector space, and, and you know the matrices n by n matrices form a ring and a vector space and so on. And so um, let's just find a basis for this thing first. And so this this is really easy to do because any n by n matrix right is just this grid of n squared entries right. So this is n by n. And each of these entries are completely independent from each other in the sense that if I change one of these entries, I get a new matrix. And so what that tells us is that if you want to fix a basis for this thing, we just have to um, consider the following set of matrices. So I'm going to write it out first, and I'll explain what it means. So GL of n comma f is equal to the span of the E sub i j where 1 is less than or equal to i, comma j is less than or equal to n. And so the E sub i j refers to the matrix that has 0 everywhere except in the i-th row and the j-th column entry. So it only has 1, 1, and every, uh, everything else is 0. 
And so I hope it's immediately obvious that there are n squared of these things, one for each entry in the matrix. And if you want, say, a in this spot here, then you just need the term a times e sub 1, 1, or a is some scalar. So this is, this is a basis. And this is a basis that's, that's not only very obvious and, and it ends up becoming the canonical choice, but it's a nice basis to work with because it's very compatible with the, um, the bracket operation that we've imposed upon our endomorphism, um, our matrix ring, that is. And so let's take a look at that. So as I said in the last video, checking the commutation relation on the basis vectors is enough to understand what goes on for the rest of the space because of bilinearity. And so if we can understand what the, the um, bracket is between any two basis vectors, then we have a feel for what it is between any arbitrary vector, right? Because any arbitrary vector would just be a linear combination of these things. So here I'm, I'm taking the bracket between E sub ij and E sub kl. And so by the definition of the bracket, this is equal to E sub ij times E sub kl minus E sub kl times E sub ij. Now, let's just study one of these pieces. E sub ij times E sub kl, if you work out the computation, is it, what ends up happening is that if the insides match, if j equals k, then you get E sub I L. So you collapse the insides and you just get I L. And if they're not equal, then you just get zero. So to compactify this, uh, we use something called the Kronecker Delta, which is, which is simply describes this. It's just that it's J equals K, then it's one and zero if J is not equal to K. So it's Delta sub J K times E sub I L. And so similarly, we can do for it for the other term. So we realize this becomes a delta sub j k e sub i l minus, now look at the inside, so delta sub l i, and then uh, compare, collapse them, so you get e sub k j. And so this is very nice, this is straightforward. And, and, and at most, one of these, one of these terms will survive. Um, and so this, this ends up being kind of the reason for a lot of cool phenomena that, that can be visualized through G of n comma f. So that's a basis, and this is our kind of the bracket relation. And so those are like the two very fundamental things of Ailey algebra that we kind of know of so far. And so with that being said, after a brief remark, we can look at um, the subalgebras of this thing, which are known as linearly algebras. And so the reason this thing is called the general linear algebra, this is the remark I want to make, is that it's, re it's closely related to um, GL of V, where, where I I'm, I'm mean capital GL of V, not to be confused with lowercase GL of V. Um, and so this is equal to the general linear group, and this is uh, all invertible, uh, all invertible um, endomorphisms over V that send V into V. And so the, 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 when you study Lie groups, the uh, general linear algebra kind of is a companion to the general linear group. Um, and so I'll just leave that remark at that, and we'll, we'll go on to the next, next thing. And so um, the first, the first uh, subalgebra we'll look at is something called the special linear algebra. And so here I've written it in a different way. Rather than indexing at L, I'm indexing at L plus one. And that's because the special linear algebra is so special that it has a family associated with it. And that's so the type A sub L. And so the special linear algebra of L plus one corresponds to A sub L. And so you might be wondering, well, what exactly is this thing? And so rather than writing L plus one over and over again, I'll just use the notation of N from earlier, but we can obviously substitute L plus one as we need. So SL N comma F is equal to all matrices X in GL of N comma F, which we just looked at, such that the trace of X is equal to zero. Now, 
you might be wondering, well, what if we pick a different basis for to represent g l of v as g l of n comma f? And the great thing is that the trace is invariant under choice of basis. So this is actually well defined. And so equivalently, we have s l of v is equal to x element g of v such that the trace of x is equal to zero. So certainly this is a subspace of g of n comma f. There's no doubt about that. But we have to check, is it a Lie algebra? And so recall from the last video, we had the subalgebra criterion. And the subalgebra criterion told us that uh, a subalgebra k is a subalgebra if you bracket anything um, inside k, you end up back in k. So, so the only criterion we need to check is that if you bracket two matrices that have trace zero, does their bracket have zero trace? Um, and what's really interesting is that it doesn't even matter what, um, uh, it, 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 so let me verbalize this appropriately. So let's just take two elements of SL and comma F. So their trace, so if, if you want the, their commutator to be an element of S of n comma f, then the trace of this thing has to be zero. So the trace of x bracket y is equal to trace x y minus y x equal to the trace of x y minus trace of y x. But the trace is symmetric in the sense trace of x y is equal to trace of y x, and so this is equal to zero. And certainly, um, x bracket y is an element of SLN and comma f. But what, what I was trying to say earlier is that it didn't really matter that x and y were elements of SLN comma f. They could have actually been elements of GL n comma f. And so we'll see this later on, but SL of n comma f is actually something called an ideal of GL n comma f because uh, you can br you can not only can you bracket with stuff inside of of the subalgebra and stay in there you can bracket with stuff outside of it and you end up back inside so um, just keep that in mind but don't worry too much about it and so uh, the special linear algebra is defined as such and so we we'll try to do the same thing as we did with um, GL of n comma f and specify a basis so the first thing we want to look at is just Let's just consider, say, the three by three matrices, right? So we have something that looks like this. There's nine entries, and we want to find the basis for all trace zero matrices. Well, certainly we can use the same EIJ as long as they're not along the diagonal because those all have zero trace. So we can certainly use E sub IJ, where one is less than or equal to I, not equal to J, less than or equal to n because these things will all have zero trace and so we can we can this is all independent these elements are all independent of each other and it doesn't really matter what we put in there the problem is along the diagonal right if i specify this element and this element then this element becomes fixed and so what we realize is that we actually can specify any n minus one of the n diagonal elements, and then the last one will be whatever we need so that the trace is zero. So a nice choice for this are the, are the matrices E sub i i minus E sub i plus one, comma, i plus one, or one less than or equal to i less than or equal to n plus n minus one. And so an example of such a matrix in, in the three by three case would be this matrix, one minus one, zero, where everything else is implicitly zero. Another example would be um, one minus one, like that. So these two span kind of the diagonal of um, the special linear algebra. And so collectively here, we have our basis and there's n squared um, minus one totally, because it's n squared minus n plus n minus one. And so that becomes n squared minus one. And so, um, the dimension of SL n comma f is equal to n squared minus one. Um, and so this is just the n equals three case that I use to generalize to um, any any finite n. And so the the special linear algebra will play a crucial role in all things to come. And one of the the most 
and importing cases is the family A1. So that is SL2F, right? If L is equal to 1, then that corresponds to SL2F. So let's just take a closer look at SL2F, and then we'll probably um, stop the video here and then make a second part. So SL2, F. So this is all two by two matrices that have trace zero, right? So immediately we have a basis that is zero, one, zero, zero, um, one, zero, zero, minus one, and zero, zero, one, zero, like this. And so this matrix is generally called E, this matrix is generally called H, and this matrix is generally called F. And SL2F is extremely important. This is like the example that everyone loves to use to really understand some more um, general results. And the, and the thing is that SO2F actually ends up showing up a lot when we study semi-simple algebras. Um, and it, it just, it's, it's just such a nice example. And um, what's really nice about this thing is the commutation relations. And so what we have is um, the following commutation relations. So H, so as once again, these are basis vectors. So if you if you understand the commutation relations between all of them, then you get um, it for the whole space. And so the commutation relation of H bracket E is equal to 2E. H bracket F is equal to minus 2F. And then E bracket F is equal to H. And so uh, recall that the, we only have to, it, it, the order doesn't matter, it's, up, it's equal up to a negative sign, so we only have to specify it like this. Um, and so, I guess, I guess this is just the early picture of SL2F that I want you to keep in mind. Just remember this, um, and we'll, we'll actually talk about this in a future video, so I will, I'll, I'll end this here. And so, this is type AL, the special linear algebra, um, and yeah, so that's enough for this video. Thanks for watching.